God of all creation. You stir our hearts today. You challenge us to put aside all of our to-do lists and all of our, our wants, needs, <laughs> worries, and invite us to welcome your joy. For you, O oh God, are the gift. May we, for a moment, turn our hearts to what you long for us to know, that you have loved and forgiven us before, now, and forever. May the words that are spoken today be the words you intend your listeners to hear, and in hearing, together we share. We pray this in your name, Christ Jesus. Amen. Not often do you get to read during Advent, <coughs> you brood of vipers. So let's dig in deeper to figure out why great scholars thought this was a passage that we should hear and in hearing grow closer to God and one another this third week of Advent. When our theme is joy, I don't know about you, but I felt like I just got scolded by John. Maybe that's what he intended, a little bit of shaking things up to get our attention, to turn our hearts to what God longs for us to know, that God never abandons God's children. In a season when worth seems to be how much you can pile under a tree, God reminding us worth comes from God and God alone. And you and I, because we are the children of God, have worth. We are worthy. Sinners, yes, but worthy of love that goes beyond our imagination because it includes forgiveness. That is something to be joyful about. But I can say right now with this, my biggest smile, I can do my biggest woo-hoo, and you still look at me with the most stern Lutheran faces I've ever seen. <laughs> so instead, you're going to turn to each other and say, today is a day of joy. Say, today is a day of joy. Turn to your neighbor. Today is a day of joy. All right, see, you smiled on that. <laughs> It's a woo-hoo kind of day. But John got our attention. The hope is that we will see this day as unusual, different. Why? Because each and every day that God has gifted us with is a privilege. And when you get a privilege, don't you often respond with, wow, thank you. I want to remind you, this isn't that joy that you receive, like, like I said, over the top, um, you're at the best football game ever, unless you want to. I mean, that would be wonderful. But this is that joy where you feel contentment that you know is not of your own making. Contentment that comes from receiving that the gift was intended for you. If there were no other people in the world, God's still claiming you as worthy, still coming as God's own son, because you and I long for forgiveness. Let's walk through our gospel a little bit. John the Baptist, what's his pedigree? Well, he is the son of Zechariah. Zechariah, the prophet and priest who, who has been praying for a son. He's prayed for many things. He prayed for the people. He's a faithful, faithful man, and he's almost given up hope. And then the angel says, hey, guess what? Now's the time. And he says, my wife is too old. This cannot be. And God reminds him through the voice of an angel, don't question God. This is a gift. And as he is put on mute for the time that he waits for his son to be born, he is reminded to respond with joyfulness when God gifts you gifts you with life. John's pedigree is also, he is the cousin to our beloved Savior. And they are cousins, Mary and Elizabeth, and they have done this journey together. His purpose, he's his purpose. Wouldn't you love to know what your purpose is? Don't you still wonder, why, Lord, why am I 
I finally figured it out. I love being a mom. It came along at a time when I didn't know that I would ever be a mom. And, and I love each and one of my children, and I ache for them. I love being a pastor. It's like I finally figured out what I was supposed to do when I grew up. And I'm privileged to walk beside you. And last week, I had on your behalf the privilege of talking with people in their most tender moments, trusted with what they were sharing with me, knowing that they longed and ached to hear God's message of forgiveness. And I felt joy in the privilege, the privilege of sharing God's love. John the Baptist method, well, a little... Well, it's just a little bold, in your face, and a little rough sometimes. He doesn't mess around. So isn't it interesting that he's going to proclaim that the Savior has come, and he kind of does a little of this over and over again. It softens a little bit at the end when he even reminds us he's not even worthy, you know, to tie or untie the sandals of our beloved Lord. So he kind of softens a little bit, but you kind of wonder, you know, he had a little attitude issue. Maybe a little bit of a grouch. Maybe he was wondering. This is what I was called to do to prepare the way for someone else. Well, then listen up. Listen up. Because the Lord is coming and the Lord has come. He tells us three things today in his passage. I'm going to summarize it in the simpler language because it works for me. He told us to be honest, to be kind, and to work hard. It's not like the people didn't know this, right? Remember, they've come through and for centuries and for generation after generation, they've heard the 10 most important things to do on how to treat God and treat one another. Honesty kind of is infused with a relationship with God. Yet John the Baptist says, be honest. Collect no more than what is appropriate. And he says, be kind. Share what you have with those who have none. In a season when it is so hard to not want all of it, he says, share what you have. For it was God's first and always. It's a gift. Share what you have with those who have nothing. Can you imagine what it feels like to take your children by your side and go to a food pantry and, and that's where you go shopping? And it becomes typical for your children that that's how they will get nourishment. We are blessed by those who are willing to humble themselves first and let the need be known that they need food so that we can give of our treasures give from our cupboards and share. For if they do not let us know what they need, we remain silent. In this season when you drive by houses with all the lights outside, sometimes we start summing up houses, right? Wow, they must have it all together. Their, their lights even match. Or they have a lot. I'm kind of predicting this will be the year of a lot of lights because the weather right now is really nice. And all of us who forgot to get them out earlier, maybe strand a couple more this afternoon. The lights, as if that's worth. In our house, my beloved husband is very, very um, tolerant because I can't get enough Christmas lights. Whenever I see a corner that's dark, I just leave even a pile of lights on the floor just to lighten that all up because it's dark out there. And I don't know about you, but when it becomes dark, I, I recoil. I come back into myself. I, I, I come back and I, it's hard to get out at night even. I'm done at 4.30, right? It's dark and, and I can easily, easily put myself in a quiet place. Yes, there is time for quietness, but we have been called to be the light. We are called to, to be the light in a very dark world. 
he also tells us, work hard. Now, as Iowans, we get this, right? I mean, I was taught you didn't even sit down when you read the paper. You had to read it at the kitchen counter, right? Because you wouldn't want somebody to find you, like, sitting and resting. Now, here's one. How many of you have been caught taking a nap in the middle of the afternoon? I'm sure none of you. Because Iowans don't nap in the middle of the afternoon, right? I'm here to tell you, you've earned it. But we're still worried. And, and I must admit, even if I get caught taking a nap, I always have an excuse. I wasn't really napping. I was just closing my eyes. Or as some may say, not sleeping, meditating. Work hard. Work honestly. Work with compassion. Now let's jump to Philippians. And he says, rejoice. To rejoice, one must feel joy. And it's hard sometimes when it is a dark world or your to-do list seems too long. And you're already throwing the towel and some of the things that aren't even going to happen. And God says, rejoice. Philippians happens to be my favorite book in the Bible. They say whichever one in seminary you had to translate from Greek into English, and I am not a scholarly person, so that was a huge battle for me. That was my jumping out of an airplane to take Greek class and survive, and I translated Philippians. And it said, hold on to the joy that is found in God. Not joy of your own making. Joy that comes knowing with confidence you are loved. Joy that lets you hold yourself up a little bit and then fall into his arms. That is the joy that is contagious. That is the joy that we were taught when we were children. Yesterday afternoon, our grandchildren were in the house and and all it took to make my littlest grandson happy was a fairly stale lollipop that Nani found in, in the cupboard. You would have thought it was the greatest gift I'd ever given that child, and I let him go with that. <laughs> joy, childlike joy. But he goes one step farther. Paul says in his letter, let your gentleness be known. In a world that's really publicly, by the media, angry, or must be because all those commercials seem to be working, you know, the angry commercials. And then the one candidate running for political office that just kind of is nice would kind of go mute. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not always excited about living in Iowa during the political season. I'm kind of done already. And I wonder, do they not know gentleness? the compassion that God is, is calling us to be. See, it's meant to bring hope. And it's really hard to bring hope with your fists. John the Baptist tried to bring us hope with shaking his finger because the one that would teach us gentleness was yet to come. Now, you and I know how this story goes. We know that God dwells with us now, yet we spend this time waiting. It's the waiting yet knowing, knowing yet waiting. And if you know how this goes, the welcome, the invitation to say, then don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, this isn't a wish list time. This isn't that time where you say, God, here's what I want you to do for me. With thanksgiving and a joyful heart, we say, Lord, you know me. And here's where my worries are. Here's where my heartache is. And in knowing, oh Lord, I'm going to rest assured that it is well. It is well because it is well with you, oh God. For ultimately, oh God, you, you hold my loved ones near. This is greater than me. Don't be anxious is not the same thing as do nothing. God gave us common sense. 
In the darkness, when I'm driving, I turn the lights on so I can see the road and others can see me. Common sense. But I trust that no matter how my journey ends, God is with me. It is well. Sometimes to hear it is well when it seems it's everything but well. Gives us an opportunity to say, this isn't about me proclaiming I have determined it is well. It's about welcoming the invitation that with God's gift of everlasting life, it is well. And we trust it to be true. Uh, one of my colleagues and I have been struggling with this this song, it is well. It is well with my soul. Because one of his parishioners heard it and said, but it's not well with me. I am battling with cancer. I can't pay my bills. It is not well. And with gentleness, they prayed. It did not remove the cancer or the bills, but reminded that parishioner, that disciple, that God always dwells with us. Recently, we had the privilege of going to Wartburg College and, and having worship with them. We did so at Lutheran Church of Hope, the place filled with these young voices, these talented college students, and they sang on Christmas concert night. It is well with my soul, knowing that finals were right around the corner knowing that some of them are seniors and just like our own son are waiting to find out what is next. And they were gifted by the composer to say, it is well, for it is all well with God. God has done the work of salvation. Today when we taste the, the bread and the wine and God says, I am in, through, and around all of this, know that that is God's gift. You are well. And we respond with joy. And I'm going to see if I can do this. I want to share with you a song that I often sing at the bedside of, of those that I go and visit at the nursing home. I'm going to change it up just a little bit. But When peace like the river attendeth my way when sorrows like seas below roar whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well with my soul my sin all oh, this bliss of this glorious thought my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Sing it with me. It is well. 